Hi everyone, I would like to officially welcome you to part two of today's lecture series on ancient erotic art. Um, and in this section of the lecture, I'm going to be discussing the nervous reception to the level of uh, frequent nudity and eroticism that was witnessed during the rediscovery of the art of antiquity in the Renaissance and onwards. Um, so after the um, fall of the Roman Empire after the medieval period, um, during the Renaissance, when people started to rediscover the areas, particularly around Rome and Pompeii and Herculaneum, um, that still preserved a great deal of Roman antiquity, artists of the Renaissance really started to take notice of the antiquities that were emerging from the dirt and to take notice and interest in replicating some of the ways in which antique artists had represented the world around them. Um, so when we hear about the Renaissance, the rebirth, um, it is the sort of rebirth of the classicizing mode of art. Um, with its own innovations, of course. Uh, so the reason that I'm talking about this now is that during this period, there was a really complicated reception of the levels of nudity and levels of eroticism that were sort of inherent in a lot of classical art. So as these statues were coming out of the ground, people had a mixed reaction to the art, and a lot of people were quite disturbed by it. Likewise, when some of the most famous artists of the Renaissance were using nudity and sort of classicizing eroticism in their own artworks, um, the audiences reacted in a way that to us might even seem a bit humorous nowadays. So one example of that is the David by Michelangelo. So uh, Michelangelo's David, um, my screen is on top of his name here, uh, was erected in Florence between 1501-1504 in uh, this uh, large sort of centralized square, a piazza, Piazza della Signoria, um, just outside of some of the major municipal buildings of Florence at the time. So a very central, very prominent location. And as you can see, um, the classical nudity of a statue, say, of a god or of a, of a classical hero has been used by Michelangelo in his depiction of the biblical hero David here. And there was actually enough of a public outcry uh, against the idea of having this enormous, a greater than life-size male nude statue right in the central town square that uh, he was outfitted shortly thereafter with a little garland, a gilded loin garland, um, in order to sort of shield the eyes of the viewing public from such a potentially offensive sight um, as the genitals of the biblical hero David. Now we see a lot of the same impulses to kind of shield um, the public from the wanton ways of the ancient world also at play down in the excavations of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, now excavations really kicked up in the mid-18th century in the city of Pompeii and sort of the place immediately became a stop on the grand tour routes uh, of the sort of elites through um, the continental Europe as well as a massive tourist attraction um, in its time, so immediately a really popular public site for people to visit. And it became a little bit problematic the degree to which the decoration of the houses of Pompeii and Herculaneum, as well as the sort of um, objects and artifacts that were discovered within these households and within the public structures, um, often treated erotic iconography. And this actually led in 1821 uh, to the creation of a special part of the Naples Archaeological Museum called the Gabinetto Segreto, and here I have a picture of the modern incarnation of this, um, that actually housed all of the erotic imagery and kept it away from the eyes of the visiting public. So for a long time it was actually bricked up and completely unavailable for viewing, and then um, there was a time period in which men of a mature age were allowed to go in and uh, see these objects, but women and children were forbidden. And I think now, if you are above 18, anyone can go in, um, but it's still age rated. So it's a part of the Naples Archaeological Museum that is tucked away at the back of the second floor, where they've really gathered together um, both overt erotic imagery such as our um, statue here of Pan and a goat in intercourse, 
um, and also just imagery of, say, fertility symbols, um, all in one sort of packed space uh, tucked away at the very back of the gallery um, where people sneak in and sort of blush around and look at all of these images. Um, and by sort of decontextualizing them from their original uh, uses and contexts and putting them in this secret cabinet part of the museum, it really does heighten the sort of erotic tension of the artwork um, from the modern perspective and sort of creates the kind of sexual frisson that it is attempting to um, inhibit in the viewer. So it's a really interesting case, again, for the way in which modern attitudes towards both sex and towards sort of just imagery of the human nude in general have um, changed the way in which these objects also operate on their viewers. Um, so one final example, and here's just to show uh, visitors to Pompeii in antiquity from 1879, um, is that with the images of eroticism um, or potentially could be read as erotic images in Pompeii in the houses, um, they actually installed uh, cabinets that could be locked over the paintings that were still in situ in the houses. Um, and men could pay money for an extra fee to be allowed to see these images. And here's one example from the House of the Vetii in Pompeii. Um, here we see an image of the Roman god Priapus, who is ithyphallic. He has an enormous phallus, oversized. Um, and he is a god of both good luck um, and of male fertility. Um, here you can see that he is weighing his phallus against a money bag in this image. So he has um, connotations also for uh, prosperity, for uh, monetary prosperity, in addition to the sort of um, genealogical, um, having lots of children, prosperity of the large phallus that is also indicated by the fruit basket here in this painting. Um, so here you can see a cabinet that is installed over this wall painting so that it can be shut off from the eyes of any potential women visitors to the site um, who would not be allowed to view these scandalous images. A further example of the kind of uh, visual censorship that we see in the Renaissance and the early modern and then modern eras um, are comes from the side of the Vatican, right? So the Vatican both being a major collector of antiquities um, and a sort of descendant of the Roman Empire once it became a Catholic institution as well. And we saw, um, starting from about 1557, when there was uh, the Council of Trent, uh, where it was decided that um, all of the sort of classical statues should have their genitals covered by fig leaves drawing on the biblical imagery of Adam and Eve, who, when they left the Garden of Eden and became ashamed of their nakedness, um, covered themselves with fig leaves. So the fig leaf is a biblical symbol that was uh, decreed in the 1500s to uh, be necessary as an addition to these Roman and Greek classical statues in order to preserve their modesty and the modesty of the viewers um, of these statues in the Vatican collection. So here we just see three examples. We have uh, a Doriferos, a statue of Hermes, and uh, an Apollo Soroctinos, all of whom have had their genitals covered with the image of fig leaves. Later on in the mid 1800s with uh, Pope Pius IX, we also saw one member, uh, one of these popes take it a little bit uh, further and actually actively go through the Vatican, destroying the genitals of statues in order to sort of um, enforce this idea a little bit more strongly. So there's a really, um, a, there has been an impulse both on the sort of political social side, particularly with respect to um, protecting women from um, knowledge about sex at all or being um, shown images that could relate in any way to sex. Um, and then also on the religious front, um, sort of maintaining these lustful images um, and interpreting them as such first and then adjusting them so that they suit actually the um, visual ideals of the space in which they are being displayed. Now, at the same time that we see a sort of prudishness on the part of a lot of um, Renaissance and early modern viewers um, and also collectors of antiquities, we also see a really interesting counter impulse that shows up not in the realm of legitimate antiquities collecting, but rather in the realm of forgeries. And so I wanted to bring this up at the very end of this lecture and talk to you a little bit about it. Um, if you look at 
basically any major museum collection, um, it, they have a lot of online databases, you will find that among the small daily life objects that are easily traded, um, sort of mass produced in both antiquity and can be mass produced today, things like lamps, small terracotta statuettes, um, votive objects, these coins also, these things often get reproduced on uh, illegal antiquities markets or as replicas, right? So small tourist objects or forgeries designed to fool collectors, one or the other. And this was particularly prevalent in the um, late 1800s and early 1900s. So we see in a lot of, say, museum collections, um, objects that were donated en masse in the early 20th century and acquired in the late 1800s and um, in the 1900s often include a lot of forgeries. Now a high proportion, a strangely high proportion of these forgeries, here we have two forgeries of Roman lamps, um, are erotic in their content. So from that same period, from the sort of um, Victorian era and the area immediately following the Victorian era, um, the pre-war era, these are the things that people are interested in collecting, or at least they are the things that forgers are creating, right? So there must be some sort of consumer interest in this type of imagery, and in particular, um, not in monumental reproductions of erotic or potentially erotic imagery, but in small, easily portable, um, easily hideable, uh, little daily life objects that you can add to your collection of antiquities at a time at which people were really interested um, in understanding the past through having a pretty robust antiquities trade, both legal and, um, well, at the time it was all legal, but both legitimate and um, in terms of having people pass off forgeries as legitimate objects, legitimate antiquities. Um, so what I want you to do at the end of this lecture is to think a little bit about that interesting kind of contradiction um, and to reflect and write two to three sentences on how you relate the sort of fascination with the creation of erotic forgeries on the art market to the cultural discomfort with nudity and erotic content um, that we see in ancient art. So I just want you to reflect on that a little bit, write about your thoughts on what that might mean, um, how you interpret that sort of tension that we see in the um, record of the material culture and its reception at the, in later periods.